I'm very excited. I'm Elaine Provenzano and I'm the Children and Adult Services Librarian at the Tucker Library. I'm very excited to have Lisa Halen back with us for another wonderful program, especially a, a program um, about which brought about a wonderful, beautiful map uh, that she was key to, to bringing about. I wanna tell you a little bit about Lissa. Um, Lissa was a reading specialist in New York City school system for over 35 years, a computer analyst for 10 years after teaching. She has, she's an author. She has written newspaper articles on the history of our town, East Chester, a chapter in the 350th coffee table book, Out of the Wilderness. And she's a curator of the East Chester Historical Society. And of course, uh, the creator, one of the, 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 um, the drivers behind the creation of this beautiful historical map. She also serves on the Tucko History Committee and on the board of St. Paul's. I asked her about her bio and she said, anything else? She said, oh, my tennis is not good enough to include, but she's a great tennis player too. I know that she loves her tennis. So without further ado, I'm going to hand the program over to Lissa. If you have any questions, you can uh, put them in the chat if you have any technology issues and we'll be having a Q&A at the end of the program. Thank you, Lissa. Thanks, Lainey. Uh, my internet seems to cut out intermittently, so I will try and make sure that it works for all of us. Recently, an article in the New York Times in their real estate section mentioned something about a town that has a sense of community. East Chester goes beyond that. East Chester is community. The Tuckahoe Library staff is evidence of this. Like many libraries, the Tuckahoe Library is a community hero for keeping us engaged during the pandemic. Your programs contributed to the community of both adults and children with yoga, painting, authors, history, just to name a few. So thanks to the history advocates, the library staff, and all of you joining us tonight for your love of community, our community, and its history. Our pandemic project, and I'm from the East Chester Historical Society, was to bring our history to residents in a new visual way in this beautifully illustrated map. It's visual evidence of more than 350 years of the East Chester community with its villages of Tuckahoe and Bronxville. Maps are two dimensional, but they really are representations of the relationships between people, activity, and places. That's the heart of history. That's the heart of community. That's the heart of East Chester. We can refer to our map as either drive-by or drunken history. All the sites are still standing, so drive-by applies. When we did the map, it was during the pandemic. We met masked on my patio and we drank wine, even when it wasn't cold where we needed the wine to chill up, to warm us up. Um, but if you'd like tonight, enjoy a glass of wine. We really weren't drunk. East Chester originated as a very humble community and it's demonstrated in this map. If you look on the rectangles, those are the original 10 families. You can see how each plot of land was equal. Another group of families came immediately after the first 10. A descendant of one of the original families researched East Chester land records and West Chester land records to come up with exactly where each, each family's plot was. So you, can, you saw that in the other one, but this one gives us a global view. And you can see where Pelham is up on the right. You can see the road to Miles Square. You can see the Great Creek, you know, the Hutchinson River has so many names to it, Rattlesnake section to Rattles, Rattlesnake Brook, Rattlesnake Creek, Hutchinson Creek. So a lot of these terms have been used through the years. And then this map was also done by this descendant, and David Tompkins, and here he superimposed 
recent road. So it really gives you a flavor of, of who, of where we are. Oops, sorry, let's go back for a second. Um, you can see East 233rd Street. You can see the Westchester County Bronx line. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a couple of minutes. Um, you can see the Hutchinson Parkway. So it really gives you a flavor of where East Chester was. Now, East Chester went as far south as Co-op City. And then it was part of it was annexed to the Bronx and Mount Vernon created its own community. So we are left with the present day East Chester. This map shows what's considered historic and colonial East Chester. So you'll sometimes see that. That's why there's an East Chester Road down in the Bronx. These are just some maps and patents and deeds that exist in our Marble Schoolhouse Library. How do you create parameters when you, when you, when you decide on a project? Our parameters ended up being the year 1900, any buildings prior to 1900, because that was the around that time, Bronxville and Tuckahoe became political entities within the town of East Chester as villages. Up until that time, Tuckahoe was considered a neighborhood. There was no Bronxville. And each site with its num coded number also has the date of the original building, some of which were rebuilt, but rebuilt very early. Our, our roadmap to our map really began a little before this. We had a hand-drawn map the size of a table and we put my grandson's Legos on it to try and figure out how to place the various sites. Our illustrator, John Wright, who's an historic illustrator was great because he was able to turn our ideas into sepia illustrations. And once we approved those, he started to colorize them and get them onto the map. So that's how they really got placed. So our first drive-by begins with the original 10 families. Now they ensured their well-being with the covenant, which still serves us well. It was written in 1665, just less than a year after they arrived here. Its second tenet states to keep and maintain Christian love and civil honesty. And it's a humble statement, but it characterizes a spirit of our humble community to this day. Other tenets in that list provided for education, religion, kindness to each other, helping each other, such as with their cattle. And it includes that fair division of land where each family was to receive 15 acres and no more until everyone had 15 acres and each family was to have a meadow. But I think what we really need to talk about is tenant 15, no man shall board a sojourner who is obnoxious to the company unless the sojourner amends his conduct after warning given. I think we should all have that sign in our homes. This is the original written covenant that sits in East Chester Town Hall in a vault. It is, it is proudly presented at various special occasions. Walking into Town Hall, you can't miss the large poster that actually lists each of these in today's readable English. I really think it'll brighten your day if you do this on your drive-by. A next drive-by heads to the Tuckahoe area, which is its own village. And we head west to the quarries. Remember, Tuckahoe was only a neighborhood until 1900, but we pay homage to the four quarries. We list, we just put numbers here for two of them, but they lay along this ridge along the Bronx River. Marble was discovered in Tuckahoe in the 1820s. The quarries brought Italian and Irish immigrants and many others to the community. They worked as quarry as quarrymen, stone cutters. But Tuckahoe Marble was renowned throughout the world. When St. Patrick's Cathedral was recently renovated, the workers came to Tuckahoe for our marble. It was one of the many buildings who used our Tuckahoe Marble in their structures. Books and articles extol the virtues of the marble industry and its contribution 
to our community. You can come to the schoolhouse, to the library, to find any of the books and articles. Now we move, stay still in Tuckahoe, to the Old Stone Mill and the Hodgman Building, part of the, originally part of a similar complex. The Old Stone Mill was not a stone structure at first, and it, before it was a stone structure, it housed the East Chester Manufacturing Company, and they, they made buttons for the soldiers in the War of 1812. It burnt down and the stone structure that still stands today was created. And there you can see even again, the sepia illustration that ended up colorized on our map. A part of that area has the, had the Hodgman Rob, Rubber Company, which is now the condo complex. As the Hodgman Rubber Company from, from the 1850s, they made raincoats for the soldiers in World War I. So it really continued um, how important the military was to industry and our community. It also had um, other tenants included Revlon and Burroughs Welcome. And some of these tenants had, some of these companies had Nobel Prize winners. And you, again, all of these you can find out about. Two other, first of all, that's Main Street around 1900. So it really reminds you, you can see the trolley, it really reminds you of what a rustic rural community we were for a very long time. Then you see the Samuel Fee building. He began as a worker and, and rose up through the ranks and on the quarry built his marble building, which was the Washington Hotel. And journeyman unions held meetings in the Washington Hotel. And he was very involved in the politics of the community. Depot Square, again, that could just be an entire presentation on the importance to the community and commerce. Um, I can't begin to go into all of the buildings and, and structures that are there, but just remember it has what every place has, a Starbucks. Our next drive-by takes us to the Ward House. The Ward House lies in the center of our map. It lies at the center of our history. Just like the Covenant is one of the most important documents in East Chester and in New York State, the Ward House is one of the most historic structures in Westchester County. Its history dates back to colonial times. Skirmishes were held around the area during revolutionary times. The skirmishes were between the New England Patriots. Sorry, Pats fan, not the losing football team. I know the New York teams are no better, that's for sure. But the Patriots from New England and the Loyalists in New York often met and fought in the entire Westchester area. Because we lie in the center of the divide between the New England, between New England and New York City where the Loyalists were located. The area in many books is referred to as the neutral zone. The house was originally burnt down, but after the, it was burnt down by the British because of their anti-British meetings and sentiment that took place there. It stands today after the, after the stands today because after the war, Stephen Ward's son, Jonathan, rebuilt the house to almost exacting specifications of the first home. We thank Laney, we thank Jenny Steinhagen, and we thank Richard Forliano, all among others, but they were recently instrumental in having Tuckahoe pass a historic preservation law. The Ward House was the catalyst for this when it was recently sold by Concordia. Our next drive-by takes us to the village of Bronxville, again in the town of East Chester. The Reformed Church was founded in 1850, and that has always brought a religious but also philanthropic community to the area. The parish continues to serve not just the religious community, but many surrounding communities. Lawrence Park, Lawrence's name resonates throughout Bronxville.
William Van Dusel Lawrence believed artists, writers, poets, architects would enjoy living among the bucolic hills near the Bronx River. He was right. And thus he created the Lawrence Park Art Colony, which still is renowned today. The historian Kenneth Jackson stated about Lawrence Park, often duplicated, never imitated. We're proud to have that as part of our entire community. Other homes in the area also contributed. The Fairview Estate was once a large parcel of land, which included present day Tuckahoe High School land, and also the Allendale Racetrack. The community enjoyed horse racing there until the late 1800s when it burnt down. So it was not Sunday in the park with George, it was Sunday at the races right here in East Chester. That rig is, is one of the rigs that was used in the track. And it says one of Allendale's track best rigs was the one shown above driven by the late Judge Bell Bellew. And the Bellew name also resonates throughout the history of the area. Master, the Masterton home is another home from a quarry owner. Now he was, he built the house in the 1850s because he was, he wanted to use the marble. So he built the house so he could be near his, he could be near his marble quarry. It ended up that he was a lover of art um, he brought workers to the community, but he also brought artists to the community. He was an art lover. Um, and one of the artists also bought a house long before Lawrence Park. And many artists visited and Lawrence's home was filled with art, with artwork. Our next drive-by heads us, heads heads us over east to the Hutchinson River. The entire area along the Hutchinson River was not the traffic nightmare it is today. The Hutchinson River was the lifeline to New York City. East Chester's miles of history really began along the Hutchinson River. Taverns and inns prided themselves on being located near the river. It carried prestige to be stopping at any of the taverns and inns. The stagecoach is act actually a model that we have in our schoolhouse. Guion's Tavern was, is, was near where St. Paul's now is. Fisher's Tavern was demolished around 1950s to make way for the Cross County Parkway. But the stables were needed for all of this it was the ride from New York City to Danbury, Connecticut, and then to Boston. So Boston Post Road, White Plains Road, Columbus Avenue, all the roads near the, near the Hutchinson River were important to the community for the commerce that they brought. We represent all the stables because there were so many of them by two riders, one up north and one down south. Today, that area, still has has some stables and farms and excuse me and barns it's the it's the okay Lisa you can you can do that you, you <laughs> nice to draw a blank right um twin lakes park and twin lakes farm still sit there with barns one from the 1880s and one from a cantilever, one, one has a cantilever roof designed by Frank Lloyd Wright. The only other cantilever roof in Westchester is, is at Playland. Now Twin Lakes Park is now an area where, where you can enjoy yourself. And Twin Lakes Farm is a riding academy. And if, you, if you've never ridden, you need to stop and speak to the owners. They're just wonderful community members and they're very giving. And before you can tell them you've never ridden before, they'll have you on a horse and you'll be enjoying it. Another barn, which still stands there from the 1880s was owned by Dr. Brush. He was a civil war doctor and he was a, a two times mayor of 
of Mount Vernon. He had what medicine men wanted, Dr. Brush's kumis, the safest and best food for invalids and convalescents, or nothing quite as delicious and refreshing as a glass of Dr. Brush's kumis after a shopping hour or afternoon as the club. Just what rapidly growing children need, an all-encompassing elixir. We stay over on the east side and we end our drive-by in the educational community. 1835 brought the first permanent schoolhouse a building constructed at the same marble as St. Patrick's Cathedral and other famous structures. The town didn't have enough money to polish it, but I think its rustic quality exemplifies our history. And these are just some, this is what the schoolhouse looks like with authentic chairs and desks from the 1800s and old spinning wheel we also have. You can't do anything without a modern day Google map, but you can see you can see 222nd Street and again get a sense of historic or colonial East Chester. I hope you enjoyed this, but we really hope that it helped you appreciate our rich heritage. We do hope you purchased the map and if you purchased it, we hope you enjoy it. Um, it is available at East Chester Town Hall, Tuckahoe Village Hall, our website has a very long name, eastchesterhistoricalsociety.org, where you can uh, get ordered through PayPal. And if you live in the area, one of us is happy to drop it off, or you can pick it up at any of those locations. I couldn't end without a shout out to those who made this map a reality. We received a community fund grant, and that allowed us to hire the local historic illustrator, John Wright, whose work is throughout the Northeast and New England. The map committee diligently worked to, to really make this map as beautiful as it is. Um, their input uh, as we sat and drank wine or Zoom really contributed to how beautifully the map ended up. So thanks, Lainey. Thanks to the library staff. Thanks to all of you who enjoyed us tonight who have joined tonight, you're all history advocates and we thank you for that. Thank you. I can't Lisa. do justice to every site in this presentation because we'd be here for three days. It's, so maybe it's we'll a, what a launch about. pad this is for people to get this map. I have the map myself um, and to just explore history, you know, more about our history. This is a, a great starting point um, as you were saying, and we do have a few questions that were put in the chat um, and we can answer some questions too. So um, I just Peter Carlo said he grew up in East Chester. He's now living west of Seattle. Brother Paul Carlo still there, could not have wanted to live anywhere else in my early years. Thank you. Paul Mangione has a question uh, about why did they stop sourcing marble from Tuckahoe? Um, is it too expensive now or did the quarries run out? Well, the, the, the style of buildings that the marble was used for stopped being popular, number one. One of the quarries, which is up in the north end, had to close down as one of the last quarries because it was too noisy for the, as it became more of a suburban area. So there, was sev there were several reasons for it. Um, and that's just to touch upon a couple. Now, I think our town historian, Dick For Richard Foliano is here. He's the expert on any of these. I kind of have an overview. So um, I don't know if Dick can give us a little information on that. Richard, are you, are you able to unmute? Is he there? I'm unmuted now. Is Richard now. there tonight? There no, he is. Here. There we are. Yeah. Hey, hey, Richard. What, Lisa, that was a great presentation. I'm, I'm jealous of you. You do such a great <laughs> job. Um, you're absolutely right. Uh, uh, the demand for marble had gone down. Um, once the completion of the Bronx River Parkway in 1925, uh, the north end of East Chester, which has a Scarsdale mailing address, more and more people moved there. And also 1929 was the year the depression took place and there was very little demand for construction um, for the next 15 years after the, um, 
1941, we were in World War II. Uh, but Tuckahoe marble was in demand, but uh, factors just, you know, uh, like Lissa mentioned, the, uh, the changing of the, the nature of the north end of East Shepton, the Depression, World War II, uh, and a huge fire destroyed the last working quarry, which was in the north end of, uh, of East Chester. So it, it, it really ended a sad death, but for uh, from 1821 to 1929, um, it was one of the major industries in East Chester, drawing Irish and Italian immigrants. Thank you, Richard. Do I sound smart? Yes, <laughs> we rely on you both to have I'm all sorry. these answers. I, I couldn't resist that. It's wonderful. <laughs> now, let's see. Um, I have a question here from Peter Carlo. I have the copy of a small book written for the Bicentennial and, of course, the bigger history book a few years ago. You should share how the Stewart home that was across from the high school was used as a part time White House which became a restaurant, Dan Dowd Steakhouse, and then China Garden and Apple Annie's. Do you, either of you have some interesting facts about that? Yeah, I mean, there's so many sites that we could have done, but we, we kind of limited it to sites that are still standing. Um, as I said, we could do presentations on East Chester every week and still not cover all that East Chester's rich heritage has to offer. Somebody asked about identifying where in the north end of East Chester. It was actually um, right near the Scarsdale border, a little bit east of, um, of Scarsdale Avenue. It's where Dunwoody Field is. Right, Dip, what was, what, that, that's by, over by the field over here, right? Yeah, the north end of the, the north, the one, the one quarry, the northwest right? corner of the Dunwoody section was the quarry. And I don't know, I don't remember when it was filled in, but it was filled in. <clears throat> yeah, a lot um, of them were filled in because the kids were were jumping into the hundred feet. And if if I go back for a minute to the picture of the quarry. My husband is raising his hand as you said that. Yeah, yeah, we <laughs> Much of his mother's <laughs> horror, I'm sure. <laughs> I think this picture of the quarry gives you a, a representation and a real sense of how deep these quarries were. Look at the workers down at the bottom. Yeah, that's the quarry on Marbledale Road. The one okay. that's the marble capital of the world is the one just north of Dunwoody Field. He stands corrected. He went swimming in the Leewood one. <laughs> and I have still... a question. It's Ginger. Why were Tuckahoe and Bronxville not kept as independent entities, but were incorporated under East Chester? Um, Lanny, can you repeat that question? Um, as I said, my AirPods aren't always as, as uh, crisp as they should be. Why were uh, Tuckahoe and Bronx were kept as separate entities within East Chester? Within East Chester. Well, within they East decided East. to become their, uh, their own villages. They wanted their own government. Um, again, Richard, I know you could talk for hours on why each of them wanted to become their own entity. There was some embezzling going on in East Chester. So I think that was one of the reasons for Tuckahoe, Bronxville, became its own sense of an artistic, wealthier community. I mean, you know, you could, you could go on at, on ad on finitum about the many reasons that they wanted to be their own village, but they do remain part of the town. Is One that correct, major, Richard? Yes, that's correct, but there's more to it. East Chester used to be two and a half times the size of what it is today. In 1850, Mount Vernon, which, be, which was built by a, dry goods man named John Stevens uh, became a village of the town of East Chester. What was happening in the 1890s, New York City was getting too crowded and New York City was trying to buy up large sections of Westchester. 
Um, Brownsville and Tuckahoe did not, well, Mount Vernon decided, no, we're not gonna go along with this. We're gonna become our own separate city. Um, and so Mount Vernon uh, became its own separate city, but it was a village in the town of East Chester. And <clears throat> there was a dispute between Bronxville and Tuckahoe because there was some corruption going on in East Chester government. And Bronxville rightly said, we're paying all this money in taxes and it's going in, into the hands of Tammany Hall and democratic politicians. So Bronxville in 1898 petitioned rightly become its own separate village. Um, and four years later, Tuckahoe did the same thing. So these were neighborhoods in the town of East Chester, but the real motivation is that we wanted to keep our, uh, Bronxville and Tuckahoe wanted to keep a separate identity uh, and not get swallowed up by New York th City, thank God. Well, what does it actually mean when you say it's part of the unincorporated town of East Chester? How does that influence what happens in Tuckahoe and Bronxville? Um, villages are incorporated, uh, towns are not. And they, they, they said, we want to be incorporated into the town of East Chester as separate villages. Um, the unincorporated part, which is called the town outside, um, was not as well populated, was three times the size uh, of um, one mile square Bronxville and six tenths, eight tenths of a square mile of, um, of Tuckahoe. And they had less people than either of the two villages. It was only with the completion of the Bronx River Parkway in 1925 that the population of East Chester, which was mostly farms and small neighborhoods began to explode. Um, um, so it really has to do with uh, a lot of technicalities with the law. So what we have today um, uh, is the town of East Chester with two incorporated villages, uh, Bronxville, 1898 and Tuckahoe, 1902. Thank you. Thank you. So we have time for a few more questions. Anybody else have a question? Peter Carlo said that on Leewood Drive, the walk Oh, the walk path over to Brassy Road, the Fenston area was a lake. Wasn't that a floody quarry also? Do either of you know anything about that? Where? Brassy Road. Oh yeah, Bra I think I just saw that. Um, you know, so I have to look at a map. You know, when GPS was invented, um, yes. because I have less than a sense of direction, my own mother said to me, this was made just for you, Lissa. So. <laughs> <laughs> so you have a sense of my sense of direction. I really have to study a map to to really answer some of those location questions. Right. And and you know, I also want to encourage you, um, the Tucko History Committee and East Coast Historical Society. We have information, and besides the books um, uh, that Lisa was mentioning, we have information. We have archives, details that you can come and look at at the Tucko Village Hall. I'm on the history committee. We're there um, every week between 9.30 and 12. And we have binders. Um, so, uh, you know, please feel free to stop by there or contact any of us um, about any questions that you have about history. And um, I also wanted to mention, Lissa, um, I had shared on the Friends of the Ward House Facebook page about today's pr presentation. And somebody that I know that lives upstate three hours away said, oh, I love mine, I already have it. So uh, I, 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 someone mentioned today that it's also available by mail. Did you wanna mention that? Someone said, if, is that true that they could get it by mail for an extra $10? Yes, yes, you can if you could go to the um, to our website with that long name eastchestershistoricalsociety.org and you can order it through PayPal there. But if you live in the area, you know, you might as well stop somewhere, but if you're out of the area, we're more than happy to mail it to you. 
Our yeah, that's, I think it's great to know because people, some, as we say, some people on the West Coast, some people are, you know, out West, um, South. So we, we want, you know, everybody to get um, a copy of this map. And can you also explain that it, this, and this, this, this illustration doesn't even do it justice. Can you explain what comes with it, the beautiful insert that comes with it, the informative insert? Yes, thanks for reminding me about that, that Lainey. Um, yeah, so with it comes a, a two-page insert, which describes in a short paragraph each of the sites. And, and so that gives you a nice, um, a little more of an overview than what I just gave today. And hopefully that will entice you to research us even more. Absolutely. Wonderful. Hi, I'm Paul Warner. I'm curious, when was the trolley system eliminated? Well, the trolley used to run all the way up uh, Main Street, correct, Richard and Laney? Right. Yes. When, when did they eliminate it? I would have to, Richard, do you know the year that it was eliminated? I could get you that information. Oh, I know, in 1927, 1927, 1928. I knew he would know that. Wonderful. I told you Richard would know all these answers. I know, I know, it's great, it's great. Um, and, and we just did a program, um, if you're interested in the trolley, we had, um, we will have it up shortly on our website. Uh, Nixon Zano did two uh, drive-through of Tuckahoe before and after, and the second presentation had talked about the trolley going up uh, into Waverly Square, and some information about that. So I will send that out to you, Paul, too, just so you have that and you could view that. It's very interesting. I had a question about the size of the map. It doesn't say how big or small it is. I'm sorry, Lainey, I just need to have you repeat that, as I said. Yes, the size, Lisa, of the map. Oh, it's 12 by 18. It is a standard framing size. You can get a frame for it at uh, uh, just a basic frame for it for about $25 at uh, <laughs> Michael's. And I have a couple of friends, one of whom is here tonight, Abby Hirsch, who had a professionally framed, and it's beautiful. Thank you. It's a great Christmas present, ne holiday present for, for next year. So buy a lot of them and you'll have your Christmas <laughs> shopping. Valentine's, going. right? Valentine's. Going. There you go. And, and I wanted to also um, thank the community fund uh, because I know what the community fund does for the community, what they do for the library, what they did for this project. So what a, what a beautiful um, investment the community fund made in the Eastchester Historical Society that you're able to share this, this um, really beautiful piece of work that will be, be teaching us all about history for years yes. to come. So Lisa, I can't thank you enough um, for you sharing this with us tonight. And I look forward to more well, presentations. Lady, I can't thank you enough for always inviting me back. <laughs> and that will not change. That will not change. We love having all of you. And Richard Forliano, the Eastchester Town Historian. Uh, we're so grateful to have these, these uh, you know, wise members in our community that could, you know, share this, this, this beautiful historical knowledge with us. So um, kudos to, to you all. And thank you all for coming tonight. Um, and I'm also Mar Marge is saying thanks from Alice White. Alice is, uh, Alice is saying thank you. Um, purchase the map, Elaine? Village Hall. Village Hall. Thank you for saying that, Ginger. The map is available for sale at the Tuckahoe Village Hall uh, for $25. You can go and ask Jackie, uh, the town clerk, and she will give you one, or at the Eastchester Village Hall, Vill Village Town Hall. So Tuckahoe Village Hall, Eastchester Town Hall. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for attending. And everybody have a great evening. Thanks thank you. again, Lainey. Thank you, all history advocates. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Elena. And thank, thank you, everyone, you. for joining. Thank you. It was wonderful. By your, thank you so much. By your helping me out.